Uh, good morning and uh, welcome to the 19th meeting of 2014 of the Public Audit Committee. Um, I have apologies, Ken McIntosh is running late, but he will be with us at some point. Um, the first item on the agenda is an invitation to declare interest. Um, members will be aware of significant changes in SNP committee membership across all committees. Um, and Bruce Crawford, Willie Coffey and James Dornan uh, have now left the committee. Um, Bruce hadn't been with us um, for that long, but even in that short time, uh, he, he brought his own inimitable style to it. I have known Bruce for many years predating uh, this parliament, and uh, it's always been a pleasure to, to work alongside him. James Dornan had been a member uh, for, for some time and w w was equally very assiduous in, in what he'd done. But yeah, yeah. I want to make a, a particular mention of Willie Coffey. Yeah. Willie Coffey um, had been a member of this committee possibly since uh, just after 2007. Um, so he's certainly the, the longest serving continuous membership of, of, of the present group and maybe indeed of, of, of any member. And I think over that time we were all struck by uh, Willie's attention to detail and, and, and also his life experience um, was, was very useful uh, in many of the reports that, that we looked at. Um, so um, I, I'm not sure what Willie has actually moved on to, but I'm, I'm sure he will bring um, this, the same uh, attention to detail and the same effort that he put into this committee, and, and we certainly appreciated the efforts of all of them, but also, uh, but in particular, uh, just, I think, need to pay tribute to Willie's long-standing uh, service to the committee. Um, we have a formidable uh, group of uh, MSPs replacing them. Um, Nigel Don, Gil Patterson and David Torrance. Uh, and I know, David, you have already been a, a substitute member of the committee, but can I just, um, for formal reasons, um, invite all of you um, to um, declare any relevant interest that you might have, Nigel? Thank you, convener, uh, and it's a pleasure to be here. I simply draw members' attention to my register of interests, and I don't believe I have anything to add to that in the context of this committee. Okay, Gil. Hey, nothing to add, but refer to my members' uh, register of interest for the public or the committee to peruse. Okay, and David. Um, nothing to add. Ju just refer members to my register of interest. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, second item on the agenda. Uh, decisions about taking business in private. Members will note that we've already decided to take item five in private. Can we agree to take items four and six in private as well? Okay. Thank you. The third item on the agenda, section 23 report, community planning, turning ambition into action. Um, this is a, a joint uh, report from the Auditor General uh, for Scotland and the Audit Commission. And we have Carolyn Gardner, the Auditor General, back at the committee once again, and uh, again, um, Douglas Sinclair, um, a man who has had many roles in Scottish public life over uh, many years and has probably a, a unique insight, insight into the, the workings of, uh, of the public sector in, in Scotland, and also Anthony Clark, who's the Assistant Director of Best Value Scrutiny and Improvement. Um, I think, uh, Auditor General, you would like to make a contribution? Thank, Thank you. you, Convener. I'll introduce the report and will, as always, answer questions jointly. Um, some of you may remember that in March 2013, the Chair of the Accounts Commission and I gave evidence to this committee on our last report on community planning. Uh, this report provides an update on progress since then and gives a, a sense of the direction of travel and, of community planning in the context of the Statement of Ambition. Community planning is really important because the government sees it as a central plank in its plans for public service reform, um, in making the shift to prevention and in meeting the continuing pressures on public finances. So how well community planning partnerships are working is a central part of the plans for all of those important areas of reform. In our report, we found that aspects of community planning are improving. All of the partners are more actively involved than they were in our last report, and they're now agreeing shared priorities that they can work together jointly in the context of community planning. There's a better understanding of the resources that they've got available to them, and they're recognising the importance of prevention and thinking about what they can do to make that a reality. These are really important building blocks, but there's lots more to do. 
For example, this time round, we've still found little evidence of effective leadership, scrutiny and challenge in community planning partnership boards. And many community planning partnerships are still not clear about what they're expected to achieve or about the specific improvements they're aiming to make. The Scottish Government, the National Community Planning Group and COSLA have an important leadership role in overcoming those shortcomings and they have taken steps to promote the importance of community planning. In July, the National Community Planning Group issued a set of principles for partnerships focusing on prevention, joint resourcing, community engagement and reducing inequalities. This was intended to set out an ambitious but realistic improvement agenda for community planning based on the experience so far of implementing the Statement of Ambition. The National Community Planning Group, the Government and COSLA now need to work together to set out what this refocused approach means in practice, what they expect of community planning partnerships and how success in implementing these new principles will be assessed. We think that two important aspects of that work will be addressing the uncertainty about the extent which the focus of community planning should be on local needs or on national priorities, and in providing greater clarity about the role that community planning and partnerships should play in public service reform. We found that community planning partnerships have begun to identify what resources they've got available to deliver their priorities, but they're not yet targeting those resources as effectively as they could do. That's particularly important as pressures on budgets and staff tighten when partners will have to make difficult choices about allocating their resources between competing priorities. They'll also need to work closely with local communities to ensure that the significant changes that are needed to how public services are delivered do command public support. In addition, public bodies are held to account mostly for the performance of the mainstream services they deliver and their achievement of national targets, and this can cre create additional tensions. As I recently reported, NHS boards focus on meeting challenging financial and performance targets each year does make it difficult for them to think about longer-term outcomes and to do the necessary long-term financial planning to move in that direction. We think that competing pressures on resources may hold back the shift to prevention as partner organisations will initially need to continue delivering their current services while investing in the new services needed for the future. The lack of a coherent national framework for assessing the performance and pace of community planning partnerships is another hurdle. This means that there is no overall picture of how individual community planning partnerships are performing and what progress is being made towards the implementation of the Statement of Ambition. The lack of this clear national picture makes it hard for government and COSLA to identify which CPPs need the most support and which particular areas they're finding hardest to get right. We make a number of recommendations in the report for the Scottish Government, the National Community Planning Group, COSLA and community planning partnerships themselves. I'll focus on the ones that are directly related to government for the purposes of this morning, but you'll see the rest in the report. Firstly, we'd like to see the Scottish Government and COSLA working together to set out what their refocused approach means for the Statement of Ambition and what they expect of community planning partnerships across Scotland. That includes developing a national framework for assessing and reporting progress and implementing the Statement of Ambition. Secondly, because this is complex and challenging work, we'd also like to see the Scottish Government and COSLA working with the Improvement Service and others to uh, put in place a programme of well-targeted practical support for community planning partnerships in the areas that most need improvement. And finally, we'd like to see the Scottish Government holding central government bodies and the NHS to account more consistently and directly for their contribution to community planning, as well as for delivering the services that, that they're primarily responsible for. Thank you, Convener. As always, Douglas, Anthony and I will be happy to answer questions from the committee. OK, thank you for that. Um, I seem to remember discussions on um, community planning when I was a council leader in the, the mid-1990s and Douglas Sinclair was the, the chief executive of COSLA. It, you know, am I right in thinking that this debate has been going on that long? Yeah? Absolutely, convener. Uh, um, community planning dates from 2003. Uh, that's the local government act that brought it into being. I think, it, in, to some extent, it... it um, it had a fairly fallow period until the Statement of Ambition, uh, jointly announced by COSLA and the Scottish Government in 2013, which gave it a renewed 
a renewed emphasis, and as Karen has indicated, I think we did find in our audits that that enthusiasm, the commitment, has, if anything, increased. So that, that's a positive. The, you, you, you talk about the enthusiasm and, and commitment increasing, and yet, if you read the report, it would appear that it's having little practical impact across Scotland. We have been discussing this since the 1990s. It came in in the, the legislation, as you said, in 2003. And yet, many CPPs, according to the report, are not clear about what they are expected to achieve. Now, frankly, if community planning is worth anything and if it's of value, then surely people should be clear about what is expected. And if it's of no value, why are we bothering to persist with something that uh, people are, are, are doing nothing about? You know, the, the report says governance and accountability in CPPs remain weak. And yet again, and this is not the first time when we've been discussing um, some of these public sector boards, there is limited evidence of challenge at a board level. Mm. So not only do they not know what they're supposed to be doing, which is frankly outrageous, but when they are there in a position to do something, they are not challenging. Um, so what, where is the public accountability and the public scrutiny if we have people who are not challenging and frankly also people who don't know what they're doing when they are there? What's the point of this? Well, maybe I could kick off on that one and Caroline come in, could come in. I, I think community planning, the argument for community planning is as strong now as it was in 2003, which is essentially that the needs of individuals or communities can seldom be met by one single organisation. If, if you look at uh, crime, uh, the control of crime, the solving of crime is a matter for the police, but the causes of a crime are out with the control of police. They're a matter of bad housing, poor health, bad education, bad planning and so on. They're they're all issues that the other partners can play their part in, in, in resolving. So I think the case for community planning still exists. I think part of the difficulty, touching your second point, is that uh, I think there's been an unrealistic expectation about what community planning can deliver. It can't solve all the problems. It's, 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 it's on these cross-cutting issues where it can add value, in, in particular reducing uh, inequality. And I think that it's taken community planning partnerships some time to understand where their added value really can make a difference. The third point is the one you make about uh, public, um, public se sector boards. Uh, one of the points we make in our report is that these are voluntary partnerships. They're not statutory bodies. There's, there is a statutory duty on each of the partners to participate, but they're not statutory bodies. They're voluntary partnerships. And if you look at the partnerships and you look at the people around the table, they all come from different backgrounds. They have different roles. They have different accountabilities. Uh, and that makes building that sense of trust and relationships, it's one of the things we've highlighted in the report, actually quite difficult. Our sense is that community planning partnerships have not invested enough in understanding the complexity of the nature of the relationships around the board. You take, for example, somebody who's a councillor, that's not the same thing as a non-executive of a health board. Chief executive of a council has a different set of responsibilities and authorities from, say, the chief executive of a health board. And I think, I think, um, I think the effective... Uh, community planning partnership boards, and there are some examples, have spent time trying to understand how they can make a difference and the, and the scope for them making a difference. Um, and I, I think that that's an issue for all community planning partnership boards to spend more time um, understanding the nature of the relationship and understanding where they can make a difference. Uh, the point you make about accountability is a, is a, fair, one. There a fair one. There are different accountabilities. The council accountable to the local electorate the health board ultimately accountable to, to, to Parliament. And that's why we're strongly recommending in the report the need for a national framework jointly developed by the Scottish Government and COSTA to assess the performance of, uh, of community planning partnerships and to ensure that those um, community planning par partnerships who particularly need support are the ones where support is targeted to. Can I just say that my, my, my criticism isn't of the people who produced the report. No. My concern is about what you have found at <coughs> local level. Now, Mr Sinclair, you make the point that the case for community planning is as strong now as it has ever been. And I accept that. But the evidence is mm. that you say, you know, mm. in mitigation, 
there are there are people on these boards from different backgrounds, and, and, and I understand that, but I would question why any organisation, whether it's council or any of the other partners, puts someone onto a board if they don't think that that person is capable of performing the duties required when they go on to that board. Now, you know, if we then find that there is... Uh, there is insufficient clarity and distinction in roles and responsibilities, then all of that needs to be to, to be worked out. But if these boards are simply rubber stamping whatever is put in front of them, with no criticism, with no scrutiny and with no challenge, then I come back to the point I made earlier, what is the point of this? Are we not just wasting good public money uh, in a model that's not working? And if it remains as important now as ever then why is the commitment not there to make this work? Sorry, Auditor General, you wanted to come in. Thank you, Convener. Um, I wanted to pick up your point about confusion about their role, because I think that's at the heart of the, the range of questions you've been asking. Um, the, our view is that the statement of ambition and then last year the refocusing on the four principles of prevention, inequalities and so on, are all important steps in the right direction. And our audit work found that in spite of that, people at a local level, the people on the boards of those partnerships, are still confused about how far what they're doing should be about local priorities and how far it has to take account of national priorities and the national performance framework and how far they should be focusing on prevention as against how far they should be looking at all public services in their areas. As Douglas said, none of these partnerships can do everything. Um, they're not set up to do that. They don't have the resources and we have a whole range of other public bodies. What we want to see is the government and COSLA really sharpening that focus on what they can do, building on the good practice that is there. We've seen some very good practice of partnerships thinking about what their area needs and what they can do and then addressing these questions of accountability that are real and can make it difficult, particularly where partnerships are struggling to make the progress we all want to see. Before I bring Mary Scanlon, can I ask a final question? Mm. Who is the, uh, which is the key organisation then in starting to make this happen or to make happen what you say is necessary? Whose responsibility is it? The, the Scottish Government has the overall responsibility in setting policy. It's been working very closely with COSLA and the wider national community planning group to do it. And we, our recommendation is to those three parties, really, through the national group, to be doing the things we've described, clarifying what they're for, um, improving the accountability arrangements, and making sure that all public bodies are held to account for their contribution to community planning. I think the other point I would add in relation to that and Karen's touch on it is that you, you don't want to lose the ambition in the statement of ambition but if anything the statement of ambition was over ambitious it talked about the board's being genuine board with all the authorities and accountabilities that the board has that 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 is not you cannot ascribe that to a voluntary partnership so some of that language needs to be modified and changed there are also issues a confusion within the statement of ambition about the the role of um, CPPs in public sector reform it says in the Statement of Ambition they should be at the heart of the development of health and social care partnerships. Now, that's not what's happening on the ground. Um, the, uh, CPPs are very confused about the nature of the relationship with the developing health and social care partnerships. So we think that it would benefit um, community planning partnerships if the Statement of Ambition was more rooted in the reality of what is actually happening out there. Okay, Mary Scanlon, and then yes. Colin here. Uh, convener, uh, if I may just turn the clock back 18 months, we did have a report on this in March 2013. And at that time, uh, basically, and, and I, I quote, 10 years after community planning was given a statutory basis, CPPs are not able to show that they've had any significant impact on delivering improved outcomes, are not clear about their priorities for improvement, and too often everything has seemed to be a priority, meaning nothing is a priority, etc., uh, etc., et and no one is taking any responsibility. Now, uh, that was after 10 years, uh, and I remember that members of this committee were, <laughs> to say the least, a bit disappointed about the progress after 10 years, but we were given many warm words and we were told that statements of ambition and lots of things were happening. So in good faith, this committee thought, right, CPP's on track. So when I got the report last week, convener, I thought, hey, here we are, we're getting an update, positive CPP. That's not what we've got. 
there's barely been any progress, and I quote convener, there's an ambiguity both nationally and locally about the extent of the focus of community planning should, to which the focus of community planning should be on local needs or about delivering national priorities. So neither the government or locally haven't got a scooby what they're doing. Uh, Scottish Government is not yet consistently holding central government bodies or the NHS to account. Uh, and then, just I, I won't read it all, but um, little evidence that CPP boards are demonstrating the levels of leadership and challenge set out in the statement of ambition that we were all told 18 months ago was going to be the answer. They also lack a focus on how community planning will improve outcomes for specific communities and reduce the gap between most and least deprived, which is a key part of the new First Minister's approach, which I support. A statement of ambition places community planning at the core, but CPPs are not clear about what role they should play. And if I could just take you over to between paragraph 30 and 31, given that this parliament is to have significant new powers, we've still got all the organisations out there working in little silos, and we've got to bring in legislation to get NHS to work with social work and councils. So with more powers coming to the parliament, uh, we're still being told <laughs> the links between community planning and national public service reform are not clear. So, to put it mildly, I'm really disappointed because I feel we got a lot of very warm words. After 10 years, there was pretty well no progress. And 18 months later, still confused at the local level. That's not good enough. Am, have I, am I right? Am I reading this accurately? I think you've summarised the concerns that we've reported on here, not always in the language that we would use, but in the right direction. Well, I've quoted them. you sure? from the report. Uh, no, you're absolutely right, Ms. Scanlon. We, they're, they're the areas that we've raised concerns about. Equally, we have this time reported that there's been progress on um, the partnerships working more genuinely as partnerships, agreeing priority, getting a grip on the resources they've got available, and some of those things. So we have seen progress as well. But the recommendations we're making are aimed at really taking away some of the barriers that are stopping that progress um, fulfilling the, the promise that it's got and especially in the context of a parliament that will have significant new powers that will still have financial pressures and where those inequalities and other demographic um, changes are going to keep on increasing the pressure but on the public fact services. that there are financial pressures is not an excuse for not working together not surely that is the basis for more advantage and more positive outcomes from working together. And how can you agree shared priorities, but you can't work them through? I don't understand that, because you agree shared priorities. You've said that twice today. Mm -hmm. In the opening statement, you've said it again. And yet, at local level, people are confused. Mm -hmm. the national government aren't telling local government. There's no tie-in. There's no integration between national and local priorities. So if you're agreeing priorities, what does that mean? It's not working through the system. I'll kick off, and I can see Douglas wants to add to it. In a sense, I think agreeing the shared priorities is the easy bit. It's, n it's not easy. But yeah, they're just not doing it. The, the hard bit is then to say, OK, if these are our priorities, who's going to do what? What people and buildings and yeah. um, other resources are we going to put behind it? How will we know it's working, given often those priorities are things that will take a generation to have an effect? How will we know we're moving in the right direction? Now, we've seen some pockets where that's being done really well. The report that we published on Glasgow Community Planning, Planning Partnership had them focused on a small number of priorities that really have got the potential to get to the roots of poverty, Ill, Ill health, inequality, and have a big difference over time. In other places, we're not seeing that. And the recommendations we're making are aimed at making sure that both for the government and at local level, people are learning from the, the experience of where it is working well, but also taking away the barriers. And some of that ambiguity that we've touched on is exactly what is making it harder for people to do it. It's not the only thing, but it would help. I, I, just my final question. I know Douglas wants to come in, but can I, can I just ask this convener? Ten years after community planning, you know, it's like one out of ten. Uh, Eighteen months after your first lack of progress, we've got more lack of progress. 
in five years' time when I'm into my glorious retirement and not on this committee, will this committee still be sitting saying, what's happening to community planning? You know, when do you think this is going to happen? Because as a member of this committee, which I think is a really important committee in this parliament, there's in personally a sense of frustration that I'm wasting my time reading something that we were made great promises and I read the cover to cover trying to find that little gem of progress and apart from one or two local based practices it's not there so when is it going to happen can, can I just say that you know the frustration is not with the people who have produced the report yeah. it's with the failure exactly. of those who are responsible yes. for implementation Precisely. Thank you, convener. We understand that. So that. That's not a problem. My view is that um, we have seen progress uh, since our last report 18 months ago, but further progress, and certainly on the scale that we all think is needed, will require the government um, and local community planning partnerships to tackle the things that we've set out in our recommendation. We've tried to make them um, constructive and challenging and to focus on the things that we think need to happen. Without that, there won't be much progress. Thank you. I think the point I would add, and I, I do understand your frustration, is that this report is probably slightly different from our earlier one, in that the recommendations aren't just targeted at community planning partnerships. There is there is much targeted at central government and at COSPA yes. and I the National that. Community Planning Group. They have to play their part. Yeah. Um, you know, it would be presumptuous of me to say that if our recommendations were impl all implemented, then in five years' time you would see progress. But we do believe the, these recommendations are fundamentally important if you want community planning to move from where it is to where we all want it to be. Yeah. So does the leadership need to come from national government? Yeah. Or I think I think all, all parts. I think the, um, the leadership from national government in terms of recommendations we've made there, particularly about <coughs> the need to develop a, a system of accountability for community planning partnerships to assess their performance, cause us to play their, play their role in encouraging local authorities to, to play a more active role in community planning, as indeed, as Carlin's indicated, national government and holding the, the, the bodies for which they're responsible to account in more detail uh, and, and to challenge them more effectively. There's an issue of challenge right across the board for, ev for all the partners. The National Community Planning Group, as we've indicated, the need to revise the statement of ambition to root it more in the reality and to set stretching targets uh, and, and I think to encourage community planning partnerships themselves to develop more effectively the point about a limited number of priorities. If Glasgow can do it, why can't the other councils do it? Uh, community planning partnerships do it. Okay, thanks. Um, Colin Keir, then Tabby Scott. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Um, I think we, everyone in, who's dealt with these reports before have seen the degree of some frustration. And for those of us who have been local authority members as well, we can see why uh, some of these things uh, come out. And I th just in really what was uh, Mr Sinclair was saying, and it it brings to mind section 49 um, of the report in dealing with the, the councillors. Uh, local councillors have a democratic community leadership role. They're put there by the people democratically, are used to making uh, the decisions on the budgets uh, in relation to those local authorities. And while NHS boards, for instance, have um, boards which uh, people can uh, become members, I suppose, but... Uh, it's not seen as an, an easy thing to get uh, attached to. And then you've taken uh, the democratic right of councillors to make their decisions and the NHS board's right to uh, deal with their budgets. For instance, I'm just using these as a, an example. Uh, but their right to deal with their budget in the way they see fit and the obvious strains that come between the boards, particularly when you're starting to talk in terms of uh, health and social care and all these sort of things. And you made quite a lot of the democratic thing there, but it doesn't look terribly democratic across the board of the CPPs. It only looks democratic over a particular section of the CPPs. When you start to bring in third sector partners or the police, how democratic are those? You know, it, it, it's not an easy nut to crack, and I can see why, just in that paragraph and perhaps the one after, um, a, a sort of small uh, identifiable cause of friction. Now, we can say from central government you have to do something uh, to make things better, give a diktat if you like, 
But until we start to reconcile that area there at the sharp end of where decisions are made, would you not agree that um, perhaps that we have quite a bit more work to do there than perhaps at the uh, more centralised end? I think the challenge for CPPs is to understand the nature of accountability, that each partner has its own accountability, as you rightly say, the, the uh, council, the local electorate, the health board, the parliament and so on. But I think the, the, what we need to encourage them to do is, as well as um, recognising their separate accountability, is to also recognise their shared accountability, their shared, their shared accountability around the CPP table. I might take slight issue about when you talk about my budget, I think the challenge, the, c the council's budget, I think it's, it's the public's budget, uh, and I think all public money is the public's yeah, budget. But, I'm sorry, but uh, that's all very well looking at it that way, but it doesn't work out that way. And well, I think, I mean, a council, uh, a council leader, um, I, don't, I, take, I would take Mr Henry's uh, yeah. experience, in this, but a council leader's looking at his budget, uh, wondering how to uh, make best use of it. Mm. And he doesn't think, well, this budget belongs to the NHS. No, no. He thinks this is my responsibility. No. I, I, I think this is what I'm trying to get at. I, I understand the point you're making. I think it, again, is part of the problem with the statement of ambition. It was maybe over ambitious in terms of all resources would be put on the table. That was never going to happen. The council, in terms of education and social work, has the prime responsibility for delivering those areas. Equally, the health board, in terms of, of health, we're talking about where budgets overlap and, and issues like drugs and alcohol, community safety. Those are the budgets that people can put on the table. And, and going back to a point that I think Mary Scanlon made, if you join those budgets up, you can make better use of them instead of. Uh, each, each partner developing his own budget strategy, if you put those budgets on the table, the community planning partnership, where budgets overlap, where interests overlap, that's where they can make a difference. And I think that's the challenge for CPPs to get into, not to argue about mainstream budgets, but budgets where there is an overlap and where they can actually make a difference in terms of reducing inequality, reducing crime and so on. Mm -hmm. That's the culture change that I think CPPs, the, the journey that they're on. Mm -hmm. okay, for now. Uh, Tavi Scott. Thank you very much. Um, I just wonder, um, on health and social care partnerships, whether CPPs have made any measurable difference to that process. I'll kick off, and again, Douglas will want to add to what I say. Um, it's early days, but one of the things we heard very strongly through the audit work that's behind this report was that community planning partnerships aren't clear about their role in relation to health and social care integration. The guidance says that community planning partnerships should be central to it, but we have separate bodies with separate geographical boundaries, and the interaction between them is something, again, that we think needs to be clarified to make sure that they understand what they're doing, that everybody's pulling in the same direction, and that when there are read acrosses between the responsibilities on health and social care integration and what the community planning partnership is doing, it that's understood and managed and planned That for. sounds like there haven't made any difference at all. All, to be honest, I would I'd say probably it, it is too early, and what they're different, what difference they can make is not clear to them or to us, mm. given the way the guidance has been d developed. So, so let far. me just—I'm trying to be very specific about this. Yeah. So, if, if we can't judge how whether they can make any difference to something that Parliament's passed in a law, uh, which is a measurable outcome mm. for all of us, then to coin the convenience phrase, what's the point of these organisations? There's a very specific thing we've asked the public sector to do, and they're playing. I take it your point is early, but they're not playing any role. The, the question that we've got, I think, is how clear it is to partnerships and indeed to government exactly what contribution you would expect community mm. planning partnerships to make to health and social care integration. We make the wider point in here about the link between this and public service reform. Health and social care integration is a really key part of mm. that. But the, the links between them and the contribution you would expect to make, how that links to the responsibilities they've got for the wider prevention um, mm. agenda across the other issues than health and social care is not clear to people on the ground so, locally. No, so measuring their answer. contribution so, is difficult and po yeah. possibly unfair on that Indeed, basis. no, I, I totally yeah. take that point. But so when Parliament passed health and social care integration mm. legislation, the government or COSLA or anyone else never said what or never specifically provided guidance or clear instruction as to what CPP's role should be in that. Would that be fair? There is a, a clear statement in the guidance around integration which says community planning partnerships should be central to it, but not what that means in practice, given the whole range of expectations that are on them at the moment, the different boundaries and the competing priorities that people have got in planning partnerships yeah. and integration. No, I totally take that. So, but it, given this is such a specific and clear area of policy that was passed cross-party in Parliament and that kind of thing, 
we, we find here that Audit Scotland can't find in its, in its assessment of, uh, uh, that you've just done for us, or for you, but we're, we're now reading, that, that it's made, at this stage, any measurable difference to that crucial part of public policy change. I wouldn't expect to be able to see they've made a difference now. What I would expect is government and COSLA being clear about the contribution they expect community planning partnerships to make so that in future exactly that judgment can be taken. But they haven't made that clear yet. We're not seeing that yet. Right, despite the fact we passed this legislation some time ago and it's been talked about for years and so on and so forth, COSLA and the government didn't make it clear what these bodies should do. To to, to be fair, I mean, health and social care partnerships don't come into full being until April 2016. Mm which is a point worth making, and the integrated joint boards will become a member of the Community Planning Partnership. Uh, and I think, as Karen has indicated, it is a bit early to say uh, what the nature of that relationship will be, but we certainly did find there's a huge amount of confusion yeah. currently in terms of the role that CPPs play in relation to health and social care yeah. uh, integration. But I could, I've, I've asked uh, the Director of... Um, of my local NHS board, how many meetings he's been to about all this over the last three years, and he looked at the sky. Yeah. I mean, there'll be directors of, of NHS boards and chief executives of councils, never mind all the other officials, who've yeah. been to hundreds of meetings to discuss this, and yet the, the clarity that you seek, you can't find, hasn't been provided in terms of their rules. I think the focus very much just now is between the council and the health board actually making the integrated <laughs> joint board work in practice, and I think the yeah. issue of the relationship with the CPP, to be fair, is of, of secondary consideration. I, I You've also got the fact agree. that health and social care partnerships are a statutory body, yes, indeed. sitting alongside yeah. a voluntary partnership, yeah, and that, that in itself creates its own, yeah. its own tension. And I wonder, there, and exactly that point, Mr. Sinclair, do, do you think, I, I wondered about your recommendations on this, don't you think you need to be an awful lot firmer about this? Don't you need to recommend this has to become, to work, Mary Scanlon's point, that this has got to be a statutory function? That's a matter for government. Um, I don't think it's a matter for, for either the Order General or the Council Commission. Of course it's a matter for government, but you can make a recommendation. I, well, for that, I, I, so. think, I think the issue is the government have made the, the decision that health and social care partnerships should mm. be statutory bodies. Mm. In the context of public sector reform, it would seem odd to create even more statutory bodies. Yeah, indeed, that's a reason why. So on paragraph 23, where Audit Scotland very firmly, and in my view rightly, point out down that paragraph that partners' formal lines of accountability are not to the CPU board but to their own organisation's board, and then we can name them all. Isn't that a fundamental failure of the system? Isn't that where it... I mean, I think you've been inferring that in your contributions this morning. Isn't that where it basically falls down? At the moment, it's certainly one of the things which is meaning that partners in the central government and NHS parts of public services are being pulled in two directions. Mm -hmm. It's clearest in the NHS, where NHS boards are held to account, as we've reported previously, for their financial performance and their performance against the heat targets every year. And those heat targets tend to be shorter term Mm -hmm. things that matter to people, Mm -hmm. but that aren't going to help us move towards reshaping services, prevention and so on. Um, We don't think that's necessarily leading straight to a recommendation about making making the partnership statutory partnerships, mm. but it does mean you need to balance what people are held to account for. They need to be held to account for their contribution to community planning, as well as for delivering the mainstream things that they're required to do. And that's true right across the piece for NHS and central government bodies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Just to add to that, one of the things that I think will strengthen accountability, and that's a difficult concept in terms of voluntary partnership, yeah. but leave that aside, the, the Community Empowerment Bill places a whole set of new duties on each of the partners in terms of committing resources, data, information, participation in community planning partnership. So I think that will shine a stronger light in terms of individual contributions towards, the, uh, towards uh, making community planning partnerships work. And I think it will be interesting to see how, how, how defaulting partners, if I can put it like that, are held to account by their parent body. Mm-hmm. Uh, indeed. And, and in, again, um, par- the other paragraph that jumped at me f- on this was 20 in which, uh, again, and you've inferred this in your evidence this morning, uh, I quote, there are a range of views both nationally and locally about the role and purpose of community planning, uh, what it can be expected to achieve. I mean, again, not just say, if they haven't sorted that out, we've had all the guidance in the world going back 20 years now, you could argue, certainly in more recent times, and we haven't even sorted out that basic dichotomy in the in what a CPP is meant to do? Well, I, I, think, I think what's been helpful has been, the, as Caroline's indicated in her opening remarks, the revised statement by the National Community Planning Group, which very much focuses on four key areas, in particular the role of community planning partnerships in reducing inequality. Mm-hmm. So I think that sharper focus 
um, is helpful and, in a sense, gives takes away the excuse of CPPs not knowing what they're there but to do. But if I was being a cynical policy maker, I say we can all sign up to reducing inequality. I mean, absolutely. You know, that's no, you're going to find no one across politics who disagrees with reducing inequality. But if you can't sort out whether it's a local perspective on how to reduce it or a national policy which, look, which this board has to implement, then we'll, we'll be here in five years' time, as Mary Scanlon rightly observes, saying, I agree, Mr Sinclair, we passed that policy five years ago, not a blind bit of difference has been made. I don't think it's an either-or. I think it's a both-and. If you look at Glasgow's <laughs> priorities, the three priorities they have, they all contribute to, towards the national outcomes. Mm -hmm. So I think, it's, I think it's actually a false dichotomy. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, Colin and then David Torrance. Thank you, Peter. Um, as Mary Scanlon has already said, about 18 months ago, we looked at this last, and uh, I remember the disappointment we had then that this had been running for 10 years at that point, and the progress had been so slow. There seems to be some progress, but it seems to be painfully slow. And indeed, last time I remember us commenting it could be another 10 years before we see a, a, a decent impact, which seems extraordinary. Now, you've highlighted a few areas here which, uh, which are of concern. One, one is of leadership, and that's, been, that's consistent through the report, and it was consistent in the last report. Is there any signs of improvement in leadership? Looking at local, at local level, who normally chairs the CPPs? Is it an independent chair? Is it uh, usually someone from the council, political, whatever? Um, I'll ask Anthony to come in, in in a moment on the specifics of what we found in this year's audit work. Um, I think we are seeing improvements in leadership by all of the partners involved in terms of really taking seriously what community planning is for, getting that clarity about the things they're going to focus on and being much more transparent about the resources they bring to it. Um, what's needed now is to build on the pockets of that happening very well in some places and to learn from it right across Scotland. There are some real beacons of good practice. We've referred to Glasgow a couple of times, but I think we were all very impressed by the difference that that is making with some of the most intractable problems in Scotland. It's not happening consistently among the, the um, partnerships that we've looked at this year and our wider um, experience through the audit work. Anthony, can you say a bit more about how the boards work at the moment? The, the majority of CPP boards are chaired by the Leader of Council, but there are examples of independent chairs, but it's, it's not that common. And just to amplify Caroline's point, I think we did observe across all of the five audits that we did this year, significantly improved attendance, participation and commitment to community planning across the piece, but still a long way to go. Another thing you've raised is... Uh, in connection with budgets, and obviously you, you make it clear that uh, CPPs don't actually control a budget, but, which I wouldn't actually expect, but you also comment that they, they don't seem to have any influence over the budgets that are being set, which seems extraordinary given the, given the fact that it's a partnership arrangement, that all these other bodies, NHS and so on, are all involved in it. Um, how, how can this be improved? and I'm sure Douglas will have a perspective as well. Um, the Statement of Ambition talked about meaningful pre-consideration of budgets. Horrible jargony term, but what it meant was that the partners should be looking at each other's bu budgets at a point where they could still make a difference, still discuss whether that allocation of resources was right, influence each other to move resources into the things that were most important and the things that each partner could make a difference at. I think it's fair to say we haven't seen much um, evidence of that so far, and in my view that's not very surprising. I think it goes back to the accountability um, that the report talks about and that Mr Keir was touching on previously about the formal accountability for those budgets, opening that up in what's often a very tight and increasingly difficult process um, in the current financial climate is very difficult. What we have seen success in and what we focused on in the report is much more about saying, OK, so if our priority is about reducing drug abuse in this area, what resources, what people, buildings, um, other assets and, and resources do we bring to bear on that? And how can we collectively make better use of them? Can we think about what the health service is, is putting in, what the police locally are doing, what social care services are doing, what we're doing in schools? And think about that pot as a single pot and how we move around what people do in the buildings they use and the ways that they work. That looks to us much more promising than trying to open up budgets at this stage, given all of the real challenges there would be about accountability and the fact that focus seems to us the thing that will make most difference rather than opening it up too wide. 
is, is there any evidence at all that uh, CPPs are able to influence the budget decisions of their partners? Do we have any evidence on that? Because it seems, it seems to me at the end of the day it all comes down to, to money in order to, uh, to achieve progress. We're seeing it in a, in a very positive way um, where people are focusing in on priorities in that way, that they are shifting what goes in and perhaps um, influencing each other's decisions about more investment or fewer cuts. We're also seeing it in a slightly different context in places where people are talking about health and social care integration. Um, so in Highland, where they've gone for the lead agency model, there has been discussion about the council putting more money in to support the financial pressures the health board is facing on services for older people. So th there's real um, openness around the resources that are needed and resources shifting. But I think it tends to be either at the margins or around specific issues like that, rather than a wider sense of what are we collectively bringing to bear on public services in this, this area. I think that's absolutely right. I think it's not about the totality of budgets. It's about the budgets in relation to the particular priorities of the CPPs and how they can influence that. That's the key bit. Mm. One, of, one of the key things, of course, is that CPPs can operate in isolation, and you have touched on uh, areas where CPPs have been very successful at tapping into local data and information. Mm. But clearly that's not uniform. Um, what, without, without the initiatives that you've strict, you, you mentioned here, which are pretty much one-off, as a routine measure, what data would they normally tap into to be able to reach the decisions? Would it all come from partner organisations? Would they have any capability to achieve that themselves? Again, Anthony's got the detail. I'll ask him to come in in a moment. Um, what we would expect them to see, though, what we would expect to see is the partners really looking as widely as they can about what are the problems that are facing this part of Scotland, what are the strengths, what are the trends, what is it that we should be focusing in on, and then drilling down to their own data to try and build on that. We've seen some examples where that's starting to work really well and some partnerships that are still really struggling with the idea of it. Anthony. The majority of the analytical support that CPPs receive tends to come from a local authority, but it also involves bringing together the data from police, fire and rescue, the health service, to look at patterns of, of service demand, demographics and social needs in the area. And some of the more advanced partnerships are starting to invest in joint resources, joint analytical resources to help them do the kind of detailed planning about the different needs of different communities to help them to target their resources most effectively. I mean, all that has a cost. Who's, who's picking up the cost? Well, currently I suspect it's largely, it's largely the council. I think one of the points in the Community Empowerment Bill is, is extending that duty on all the partners to contribute towards the cost. One of the key issues, I think, in community planning partnerships is how well they're actually resourced in terms of the bodies supporting community planning. There's still a sense that community planning is still too much the Saturday job rather than the day, the day job. Yeah. And, and I, I, we need to get that mindset shifted. And it does, requ it does require all the partners to make a bigger contribution towards the towards resourcing uh, community planning more effectively. Is there any evidence at the moment of any budgeting for CPPs for their costs that's coming from partners or as you said is it all coming from the council? I think largely it's coming from councils. I think it's largely absorbed within uh, councils costs. I don't, I don't think it's as transparent as it, as it might be. That's obviously a concern because you would expect to see buy-in from the partners and part of that is you know writing a cheque even if it's not yeah. a large one. Yeah, yeah. well, the, the, as I say, the bill, when it becomes an act, will, will in increase the, um, the, uh, the, um, the potential role of um, other partners. It's also worth making the point in the, in the bill, you talked about the leadership of the council, the bill changes that, the, the leadership that you talked about, the council chairing the CPP, the duty of the council to facilitate and maintain community planning, that, that's been abolished. So it becomes a much more a joint enterprise, a joint endeavour. But just before I bring David Torrance in, can, can I stick with the <coughs> point that, that Colin Beattie uh, raised at the end there about the costs? And, and you said, Mr Sinclair, that, um, the, that the Community Empowerment Bill will impose a, a duty on partners to contribute yep. towards the costs. In what way will they have to do that and how will it be enforced if there's <laughs> a legal obligation? Well... I think it, it, it Andy will keep me right, I think the bill talks about contributing resources, uh, information and data. What's not clear from the bill is what happens if one of the partners 
defaults in terms of their obligation. I think it's an interesting point there about the council as the arbiter. If you take away the leadership role of the council, who's, who's actually going to resolve uh, a complaint about a partner not actually uh, making their, their full contribution round the table? That's that's not not that, well. The bill's silent on that. I think it's fair to say. Yeah. So, should um, should both the, the relevant committee and indeed members look at strengthening that aspect of the legislation to ensure that not only is the duty to contribute fully understood and, 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 and absolutely clear, but that the mechanism for mm. enforcing that contribution is stated in legislation? Because the last thing we want mm. is to come back to this type of discussion yep. in a few years' time when everybody said, oh, you know, great intentions, yep. but unfortunately there is no clarity about how this will be mm. enforced. I think that's a very good point. I don't see the point putting duties in the bill unless you have a, a mechanism to ensure that duty is complied with. That's perhaps something that we can pass on to the, the local government committee. Okay, so David Torrance and then Gil Patterson. Thank you, convener, and good morning. Um, of the 32 CPPs across Scotland, there are six which share the same boundaries as NHS boards. Has it been easier for them to progress the community plan and focus on the local needs? compared to the other 26 CPPs? Um, I think we've looked at, um, one, whether it's a coterminous, coterminous boundary. I, I don't think you can argue that um, boundaries, coterminous boundaries of themselves make it, make it easier. It, it should, in a sense, but it's, it's, it, but it, it's also true. I remember one chief executive making the point to me that because our boundaries are not coterminous, that means we try even harder to make the thing work. Uh, I think uh, the one example where we did an audit, uh, which was Orkney, we found uh, that the performance uh, that would have, would have expected, given, given that common boundary, didn't didn't uh, didn't come up to expectations, largely because of a very difficult relationship between the council and the health board. And it's true to say, in any of the community planning partners, uh, Carl has just did a note to me, Borders is another example. Um, it's true of any of the partners, if the relationship between the two leading players, the Council and the Health Board, is not working, then it's highly unlikely the Community Planning Partnership will work effectively. Um, on scrutiny, on paragraph 5, it says, um, at present there is no Korean national framework for assessing the performance and pace of improvements of CPPs. Um, many of the local authorities who are a major player in it, um, like Fife, have a scrutiny committee, which... Uh, looks at our CCP performance and are they getting best value for budget. So is there not a lot of other local authorities do that who could report about the progress of the CPP? I think you raise a, I think you raise an interesting point as to um, the potential for community planning partnerships to develop their own scrutiny arrangements. I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think we had lots of evidence that there's a great deal of self-evaluation, self-criticism uh, actually happening. I think what we found is at two levels for the partnerships, you're quite right that for councils there is scrutiny in place, some of it works well, some of it less well. For the partnership that tends not to be um, the case across the piece. Um, there's not enough of the, the partnership boards really challenging themselves and each other about how well they're doing against the aims they've got. And secondly, it's quite hard to do it with a bit of external challenge in the way that good local government scrutiny does with, for example, an opposition member chairing mm. the scrutiny committee. It's hard to see how you would get that into the partnership because of their nature. And it's both of those that I think we would like to see more of, more challenge and more external challenge coming into the process. Thank you. Okay, Gil Patterson. Good morning. Um, I wanted to go back to the integration of uh, health and social care. And here we have two really big beasts uh, in, you know, in budgetary terms and the responsibilities. And this fight, I mean, it's in the whole life of this parliament and probably 20 years before that, we've been trying to cajole these two organisations to come together. And here now, we're having to use legislation to really enforce it, to try and make a, an impact. Um, and we've yet to see if that's, that's going to prove successful. I, I've got a feeling it, it, it will. Uh, you know, I, I, that's more in view. But since we're having to do that uh, and get these 
uh, organisations who are well resourced in terms of uh, people, uh, <coughs> uh, resources in terms of money, uh, uh, and yet these difficulties occur. O on the positive side, and, and this is my real question uh, coming up, what's the likelihood when these, uh, the integration takes place, the boards are set up and panels are set up and you know, some of the organisations that we're concerned about, including local authorities, will be involved uh, in uh, the decisions there. Is that likely to help this process take place or is it going to be entirely at odds from what we're trying to achieve here? Um, I, th I think we all recognise that um, integrating health and social care is both essential and has been very slow to happen in, in practice. Um, and it's a policy decision about how you go about that. Um, the government, with parliamentary support, has decided to go for the um, integrated model using either integration joint boards or a lead agency model, and we're at the early stages of seeing that happen. Um, we have made um, submissions during the, the legislative process about the things we, need, we think need to be in place to make that effective based on our audit experience across Scotland. Um, the statutory board is part of that, but a lot of other things as well will be needed in terms of the accountability, the resources, the culture, all of the things that we're seeing being challenges here. Yeah. And it's early doors in the way that can <coughs> work in practice. Um, we will continue to look at it through our respective audit responsibilities as it comes into place over the next couple of years. At the same time, though, I think that getting community planning right could either make a big contribution to that, making sure that the, the information they're working with and the wider picture of how um, health and social care sit in the, the area as a whole and the other things that affect it is right, and that people are pulling in the same direction rather than running the risk they're pulling in different directions. So almost regardless of what happens with the integration agenda, I think getting this right can help to, to make that more effective or get in the way, depending on how well it works. Yeah, but, but my question is, is the fact that this is taking place, is it likely to enhance... Is it likely to show example or in itself almost force uh, people to work together because of the two big beasts uh, uh, starting to, to work together themselves? I would have thought that if um, uh, councils and health boards can make a success of health and social care partnerships, and the key to that, I think, will be culture in the sense of um, the health board members and council members understanding their loyalty is not back to their own organisation, it's to the best interest of the health and social care partnership. It's, it's the same point if you were a councillor appointed to a police committee, your loyalty is to the best interest of the, of the police committee. I think that's, that's going to take a bit of time. But if that can be achieved and they can uh, exhibit really good joint working, I think that, that will put more pressure on community planning partnerships to say, well, if health and social care partnerships can make this work, we should be doing better ourselves. Uh, my other question was in relation to, you said that there was good practice out there, and I, I wondered if it's possible to take that good practice and, you know, and show it by example. Uh, is there a mechanism we can use, or, or the government, or, or COSLA can use, to almost uh, bring it to the table, to, to an area, of, or to, to organisations that re really are not getting their act together, and it's particularly in re reference to uh, your, your call that leadership at national level is improving, but <coughs> many CPPs are not clearly about uh, are clear, are not clear about what they are expected to achieve. Uh, mm. I would have thought that if there's an example somewhere, it might be mm. good for them yeah. to see it, see it working in, in real term in real time. Uh, absolutely, uh, one of the. Um, points we make in terms of um, future audit work we might do is that we don't think there's uh, there'll be huge benefit in doing more big audits of community planning partnerships. We've done eight across a good swathe of <coughs> different kind of community planning partnerships, urban, rural, councils, island, uh, and we, we're not convinced we'd learn a great deal more from doing as another 24, but we do think, to take your point on board, one of the things that we should we could do more not only uh, ourselves but indeed with uh, other partners is to capture good practice and disseminate that so that um, we get beyond the point that if it's not invented here I'm not prepared to do it 
um, you know, a good practice should be a good traveller in Scotland. It isn't just now, and I think there there are um, some CPPs where, who are exhibiting good practice. I think the issue is how do we how we communicate that to other partners and encourage them not to reinvent the wheel but to take it on board. But you have the points well made. And then I want to tie my two questions together. So we've taken we've taken the bold step to bring in legislation to bring about collaboration yeah. uh, between the two organisations. Is it possible or practical? Could it could legislation be used? Could could you put this into a bill mm. to force it to happen, or is it too is it just too too difficult? Well, to be fair. You mentioned the fact uh, that Karina mentioned the fact that community planning has been on the statute book since 2003, and when it was established in 2003, there was provision in the Act whereby a community planning partnership could uh, apply to Scottish ministers to become an incorporated body. No community planning partnership has ever so applied to become an incorporated body, which perhaps says that there isn't the appetite that out there. Uh, at, at this at this point in time, whether there will be in future, I, I don't know. But I, I you know, I, I come back to my point. I think it's it seems to me, uh, if we're in the business of public sector reform, as the government stated it is, to create more bodies, more statutory bodies, seems to me to go against that flow. Okay. Thanks very much. I just wanted to put a point on the record, Mr Sinclair. You were talking about the legislation would become effective in 2016. We actually didn't need that legislation. And as a representative from uh, Highland, uh, NHS Highland and Highland Council have been merged now yep. for uh, since April 2012. Yep. Yep. So there are authorities out there that are doing it. Uh, and it's very worrying that there seems to be a lack of guidance in terms of outcomes, as uh, Tavi Scott raised. But I just don't think... I think we need to sit back and wait till 2016. No, no. It is already happening. No, I think that's a very fair point, and I think um, a key part of that, and it ref reflects one of the points we make in our report, is the importance of building that relationship of trust between the leader of the council, the chair of the health board, and I think that Highland is a very, very good example of where that there was a strong relationship of trust, and they decided they decided to embark on the on the lead lead, lead agency model. We're visiting there in February convener, so we'll maybe get a chance to ask some questions on that. Nigel Don. Thank you very much, convener. Uh, good morning. Um, the focus of the report before us is, is essentially about management, and I understand that the questions you've had so far have been around that. But one of the issues that we always have when we're trying to manage something is to be able to measure the outcomes. Usually when that's in pounds, shillings and pence, you, you can find a way of doing it. But if the measure of equalities within my community is something like whether or not a child has gone to school having had breakfast before they get there, then there's a different challenge. Now, I'm wondering whether you believe from what you've seen so far that the right kind of information is simply being measured in such a way that it could then be put into an appropriate database, which could then be accessed by the right people and turned into meaningful information. My point being that if the basic data doesn't exist, you're not going to get anything out the other end. Yeah. It's a really good question, and the answer is, in some places, people are moving in the right direction. Um, we talked before about one of the confusions being how far community planning partnerships are about local needs and how far they're about national priorities. As Douglas has said, actually it's about both, but you need to be clear which national priorities you're focusing on and where and which groups of people are your focus locally. Um, and you need to both be very clear what actions you intend to take to move those longer-term outcomes and how you'll know you're moving in the right mm -hmm. direction. So providing breakfast for children in primary school or nursery school might be a really important contribution towards um, both making Scotland a great place to grow up, but also having a healthy population and a healthy older population in a generation's time. But you need to be measuring whether the right children are getting breakfast, how regularly they're doing it, how that varies across mm -hmm. classes in a school and schools in an area. And you need to be clear what else you're doing to achieve those longer-term outcomes so you can track it. Now, that can easily sound like it's a really techie, bean 
encountery thing to be suggesting. Actually, we think it is all about leadership and management. Mm -hmm. It's saying if we want to make sure that the poorest children in our area both are being decently fed at least once a day and are therefore set up to learn well at school, we need to make sure that we are um, taking action in every school, in every classroom to make that happen. That's one of the things the Early Years Collaborative actually is doing very well in, in getting some of that change happening in parts of Scotland already. Again, linking that up to what's happening through community planning is a way we think that you, you can help good practice spread, help the people who are further behind learn from those who are doing well. It, this really is all about focus and about tying together what's going on rather than dissipating it. Yeah, thank you. But if I could come back to it, and, and it, uh, I'm now beginning to, to realise why I asked the question the way I did, because I'm going back about five years to the point where the Scottish Government introduced uh, free school yeah. breakfasts and did a trial on it. And I remember trying to have a conversation along the lines of, you really need to measure this, and there are examples, and Hull would be one of them, where people have been doing this for a very long time and know how to get the right answers. But if you don't invest enough of your project in measurement, you never actually know what happened. Unfortunately, I think five years ago we didn't, so we don't know what happened. Now, I would still come back to the basic point that if you don't take the time, the effort, and therefore the money, to measure what you really need to, to be able to assess, and incidentally you have to start with a baseline or you never know whether it's changed, then the best management in the world is still guessing. So I, I do want to come back to, to, do you see in your audit work, because clearly it's not your responsibility, local authorities perhaps in particular, but the other organisations that you're working with, recognising the need to measure whatever it is, and actually then taking the steps to do that measurement. I agree completely with the point you're making, and one of the things that we often report to this committee is that that data isn't being collected. The answer is still in parts. There are some places where that's being done really well, where people recognise that to know you're getting breakfast to the right children regularly enough to make a difference, you have to be recording that and then acting on what it tells you. Um, the same is true in relation to teeth cleaning, mm -hmm. hand washing in hospitals. Yep. And in the best places, we see that planning going on in the partnership and then charts on the wall where, where you can see what's happening day by day around it. In other places, it doesn't get the attention it deserves. People think it's um, a bit of the, the sort of techie stuff either that will happen by itself or that's not important, mm -hmm. and we're not seeing it. Um, so it's one of the examples of good practice that we think government, COSLA and the Improvement Service could be helping to spread, building on what's already happening. And it's why we think that national framework for assessing how community plannings are doing is so important, so that we can, we can avoid keeping on reinventing the wheel once yeah. we've learnt what works in one place. Okay. If I, if I might convene and pursue that, though, in, in a slightly different direction, I represent a, a, a rural community in many senses. At least 25% of the folk in, in my constituency don't live in a town. And I think you've already mentioned, and it is certainly in here, I think Section 45 refers to the assessment of areas of multiple deprivation or multiple deprivation in general and the extraordinary difficulty in actually measuring that in dispersed communities. Um, now again, I, I feel that that's a problem we haven't yet solved. It's probably one we've now identified, but again, we're not going to be able to measure all the things we've been talking about if we simply cannot get down somehow or other to understanding what's happening in this farmhouse or that set of colleges, um, and we're left with the average across you know, North Angus ain't going to tell me anything that I couldn't previously have guessed. Now, again, this is, a methodological, this is a methodological question, but do you see people beginning to get their minds around how they're going to crack that, given that we now at least understand it's a problem? I think Anthony may want to come in in a moment. Um, I, I think people are starting to, in some places, again, this patchiness is true throughout, you're absolutely right that things like the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation aren't as good as, it need, as they need to be for populations as a whole in rural areas because of the, the small numbers very dispersed. It doesn't tell you enough. 
but what the best community planning partnerships are doing is using their real local knowledge. Mm -hmm. If we think about um, aspects of inequality, about children who are going to struggle most in life because of poverty and the other sorts of deprivation mm -hmm. they face, actually teachers and social workers and police officers tend to know who those families are. Mm -hmm. And you can, you can get that really local knowledge into the community planning process if you're doing it well by really working with localities that make sense, tapping into both the data and people's experience, homing in on, on small enough areas that you can get a feel for it. We're seeing that in some places, but again, it's not something which is happening as widely as it needs to across the piece. It may be just worth adding the point that um, Solis, Kozla and the Improvement Service are developing, uh, trying to develop, uh, this process of beginning to develop performance indicators for community planning partnerships in the same way they have done for local authorities, and that might, that might help the process of measurement. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to make a couple of brief points, if that's okay, to the committee. As Caroline said, this is a, an area of very patchy performance, but the best CPPs are measuring performance at the whole area level, within specific communities, and also for particular groups. And they recognise the need to gather data in lots of different ways and analyse it in different ways. And what we're also seeing is a, a real awareness across government of the need to get data more available at local level as well. Because there are difficulties, I think, sometimes for CPPs in bringing together data from different sectors because it's captured and gathered in different ways and can't always be brought together in, in sensible ways for planning purposes. Thank you. Um, I think it was useful that Nigel Dawn, uh, in that final contribution, actually brought this whole debate back to the impact on ordinary people, to children, uh, to people living in communities right across Scotland, because far too much of this debate takes place between bureaucrats yeah. and between politicians and bureaucrats. And it's in a language that no one can understand. You know, this is passing the wider public by. And yet, the significance of some of this is that it will fundamentally affect the way that services are delivered to ordinary people the length and breadth of Scotland. So something's got to give. We, we can't go on with this. We, we, we can't have fine intentions that are not being delivered exactly. um, and no means to deliver them. And I, I do apologise that if at times our frustration seems to have been directed at you, it's not that because you have provided a valuable service in bringing to us uh, an analysis of, frankly, failure across Scotland. Yes, one or two areas where there has been some success, but the overriding uh, message, I think, from this is, is one of failure, failure to take responsibility seriously, failure to implement, and failure to deliver. Now, there has to be uh, so, some kind of change to this. It's not your job <clears throat> to come up with... Um, the decisions um, that, 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 that will change things for the better, but we do value the evidence that you provide that helps us to encourage the debate that those with the power um, will, 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 will hopefully listen to when they're coming to decisions. But one of the things I did wonder about, um, it, it does seem that the whole public sector landscape in a very small country is very cluttered. You know, a number of members today have, have, have talked about some of the big organisations. Gil Patterson talked about the big beasts. But, you know, a number of big organisations that are very remote from local communities where I think David Torrance was talking about um, boundaries and areas of responsibility not being coterminous and therefore, you know, a failure of, of, of one or the other not to be able to, 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 to engage properly. And, and I wonder whether, in terms of the best use of public resources and public money, whether at some point Audit Scotland might look at the public sector landscape, whether it is too cluttered, whether there is waste, whether there is inefficiency. Now, I'm not expecting you to come up with a solution that says, you know, there, has to be, there have to be fewer... Uh, of these organisations, there have to be mergers. That's for politicians to decide. But at some point, surely, uh, we need to look and reflect that what's happening just now is a bureaucratic nightmare that, in many respects, is inefficient. 
And unfortunately, those inefficiencies are obscuring the excellent work that's often been done at a local level right across Scotland. Somebody at some point needs to put on the table an analysis that will draw up short politicians of all parties and hopefully you know, make them think uh, a bit differently about you know, what, what, what has been done. So you know, I'll leave you with, <laughs> with that thought. But thank you very much for um, what turned out to be you know, quite a stimulating discussion on a subject that is uh, probably dry and obscure to most people. So thank you. Um, and with that, we will move in to private session.